everyone. It's great to see everybody. Thanks for uh, coming out in all of these different time zones. It's wonderful to see everybody. It's a great pleasure to introduce Carla. Carla, uh, who all of you know already, but uh, Carla did her undergraduate work at uh, Trieste and then did a uh, master's and PhD at Princeton and then did postdoc at uh, Harvard Med School before taking a job, I think in 2013. She's been a professor at the University of York in the beautiful city of York. Um, which uh, we would all like to visit, uh, but this is the best we could do um, for the moment. So thanks everybody for being here and thanks very much to Carla for agreeing to give a talk. Welcome, Carla. Thank you. This is uh, absolutely a fantastic opportunity. If I knew I had such a huge global audience, maybe I'd have been even more nervous <laughs> than I really am. Uh, but I have a lot of uh, people that know a lot of this work that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, Avi has helped and worked on this, and Jeremy, who's a co-author on all of the papers you're going to see today. And um, I'm going to start off uh, with this work. This is um, quite a, um, a lot of work starting from 2013 up to now on a very specific topic that I think um, is something new for many of you. Um, and uh, that's why I'd like you to come and basically ask me questions as we go along, because I don't want to overtax your working memory on this. So let me just get set up um, and start this. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, all good. Okay, so uh, I'm going to discuss, uh, talk about GIST in medical image perception and how um, that can help advance uh, cancer detection. Now, uh, for all of many of you, you know what GIST is. I always feel that the best way is to experience it every time it gets me. So I'm just going to ask you here to take a quick look at this movie and let me, and kind of try to see if you can see a gorilla. Sure. And uh, here we go. Was that successful? Everybody saw a gorilla? I, nope. Uh, it's maybe, it doesn't work so well on Zoom, which is another interesting thing. I'm trying to think maybe we should, it's something to uh, research on this point. I'll try to play it again. Yep. No. <laughs> Maybe this will help. So what do we mean by GIST? Many people, uh, for many of us, GIST is just kind of refers to uh, the feeling that we know what is in the image. And uh, if I show you this image very quickly, like this, you probably have a good sense of what you've seen. You probably have a sense that it is, there is water involved, that there are some birds and there is maybe a bridge and so forth. However, just knowing what in general a category scene is, is I, in my opinion, is not uh, enough to explain what really just is. So my main in interest in my work is to understand what is it that allows us to make that general assessment of a category in blink of an eye. So before I go and start talking about GIST in mammograms, let me just define what I mean when I talk about GIST in general and something that we're more used to. For example, uh, what a, I think affords you the ability to have a sense of a gist of this scene is the fact that you uh, very rapidly have access to global image properties, uh, spatial with different uh, spatial resolutions, basically the spatial envelope as defined by uh, Olivator and Toralba. Uh, you also have uh, access to certain very rapid object detection based on what we refer to as disjunctive features, that is intermediate features that have not been bound into an object but are diagnostic of a certain category, let's say a wing of a bird or a beak of a, bir uh, of a bird might signal that there might be a bird in this section. And lastly, and at least summary statistics, something that I know the Whitney Lab has worked on and others, and that is basically the statistic of a, a set of similar objects and that all of these three aspects of processing share 
two very important, um, I think, characteristics of what I would say is just processing. One is that they are distributed across the whole scene. So it is, uh, in this sense, you lose uh, any uh, location information. So you cannot pinpoint anymore where things are. And the second is that they are accessed very rapidly. And um, as we would like to say, this type of processing bypasses the problem of uh, a selective bottleneck. And that's why I often refer to this type of processing as non-selective processing, as Jeremy would say too. So this is great that you can do something like this with natural scenes. The question is, um, is this useful? Does this, um, is this something that we can uh, use uh, further than just um, as a show that you can do something rapidly or rapidly perceive a tiger from which you need to escape from. Well, one big problem in the real world is um, detection of very hard to find and very nasty um, illnesses uh, or dangers. And one such problem is detection of cancer in medical images. Uh, this is a big problem because even though with the, all the advances of medicine and the ability to uh, access uh, not have non-invasive techniques that allow you to see inside a human body, uh, we still make uh, mistakes. There's about estimated that uh, in mammography about 30% of cancers are missed. And the question that we wanted to ask is, well, can we make a difference in this section? So if we can do detect very rapidly uh, that you just, um, a category of a scene, can you detect if there is a cancer in this um, image? And it's for some reason stopped there. That's the image, it didn't work. But the point is if I flashed this, a mammogram very quickly, would you be able to find where the cancer is? Like you were able to detect that you saw a park scene with some birds in it. This is where the cancer is. And even after so many years of looking at these images, I still find it hard, a very hard thing to detect it and always like to have my region of interests right there. So. The first question in this talk, what I'd like to share with you is our research on looking at GIST in medical image perception. And the first thing that I'm going to address is to say, well, is there such a thing as a GIST signal in medical image perception? Then I'm going to talk to you about the, some of the things that we know about the global GIST signal of the abnormality uh, asking can we characterize the global GIST signals detection descriptor and whether it is related to holistic processing. And lastly, uh, we we'll try to kind of convince you that this GIST signal is useful and why is it useful. So the first question is the GIST signal in medical image perception existent. We wanted, this started way back when I was working with Jeremy in um, in his lab and we went to the Brigham and Women's to ask to see if we can uh, do some work that might be useful to radiologists and I was getting trained on what an, um, what is, uh, what does cancer look like and when we came to one aspect of cancer which was what they referred to as architectural distortion that kind of inspired me because it made me think of just because when I asked how do you define it? They said, we really don't have a definition, we just know. And the people that just know, we call them that they have the force, which always made Jeremy and me giggle uh, because it's of a certain generation. Um, anyway, so we wanted to see, is this something that is real or, or is this just selective memory? So what we did with our first study, we basically did our flash paradigm. We, uh, we um, went to crashed one of the breast imaging um, conferences and did something that's unthinkable to radiologists, which is basically we did, we presented them 
first with a very with a fixation cross, then presented them with bilateral mammograms. So that means mammograms of both both breasts for different uh, very brief presentations. We masked it with. Uh, a blank and then a blank outline mask and then ask them to localize uh, on that mask where they thought there was an abnormality and then rate it. So we managed to collect 55 radiologists uh, for this uh, exercise and to our big surprise we found um, quite a significant gist signal that is uh, we saw that the radiologists could actually detect these abnormalities, which were spe specifically selected to be very subtle abnormalities. Those are these architectural distortions, which are hard to find, uh, but signal uh, a sure presence of cancer. So uh, let me just orient you to the graph, to this data, which I'll be presenting throughout the talk. And then this is, I'll be showing you ROC curves. And here I'm plotting performance, uh, false alarm rate against hit rate, and the dotted black line is chance performance, as you can see at all of the presentation durations we have above chance performance, even at 250, so quarter of a second. So uh, it's not selective memory, they can actually detect what we refer to as just of the abnormal. Another interesting aspect of it is that actually the radiologists, even though they were good at detecting it, really had no idea where the signal was coming from. They were a chance at um, localizing it. You'll notice that even at 90% uh, confidence ratings, they were a chance. So they did not know where it was coming from, but they were performing above chance. Question? Sure. On that previous slide um, with the ROC curves, was each point one subject? Uh, sorry, no, each point is not one subject. What I'm plotting when I'm plotting the ROC is that you see they were giving a confidence rating, right? So they would not say present or absence. They would uh, rate their confidence rating from zero to 100, at which point, uh, so, you, you, you had a confidence rating as a score. To calculate the false alarm rate and hit rate, you would, uh, on each, every 10 points, you would put a limp, uh, kind of um, uh, a threshold and you would decide if anything is below 10, then that's uh, yes, anything above is no, and so forth. And you would move that confidence, you would move that, criterion. And so uh, the points that you see in each one of these is uh, what is the false alarm rate and hit rate uh, based on that cutoff criterion. Does that in make other sense? Words, in other words, those FAs are confidence ratings. Scale, yes. Scale. Yes. Yes. Okay. Shall I continue? Yeah. Okay. So, um, we did this not all, so if you were thinking, well, is this something very specific to uh, mammography or radiology? It is not. We tried this out also on pathologists, um, looking at images such as these, which are called micrographs, so images that are very different. And uh, we did the same type of experiment, but now using these micrographs and we presented them at a quarter a second or a second. And again, here I'm plotting false alarm rate against hit. And uh, you can see that they are in both cases above chance. So it's not uh, related to the image. It seems that even in these, what seem to be very artificial images, uh, people are able to detect um, what in this case is just of cancer or just of the abnormal. Obviously, this uh, would imply that they are using the visual system, but the same way uh, we would use for natural scenes, but here they've tuned it for what for us are these artificial uh, images, though for them, this is something of an everyday. Most of them see about 100 of these a day uh, in their regular practice. 
Can you ask a question, please? Sure. Um, I see, you see the D prime is going up as they watch longer and longer. Um, that is correct. Are uh, in this that associated stage. with eye movements? Are they scanning with eye movements? Uh, at one second, you're probably, uh, we are, they've made, let's say about two eye movements and that sense gives them a better sense, yes. Um, but at a two, quarter of a second or half a second, there is no eye movements. We did recently a study uh, where we gave them uh, the ability to um, give their first impression. So the image did not disappear, but they would give their first impression, which means they made a couple of eye movements and we don't see a huge difference, a huge improvement. Um, if you just give you kind of a ballpark, when they're doing this on a normal basis, when they have all the time in the world to do this and report, their D prime is somewhere between two and three D prime, mm -hmm. just to give you a sense of the ballpark of where they are. So the so scores is all seem to bunch for the shorter times. And so it, it really took off at a point where they had time to look around. You see, and that origin, the first ship, the first you showed, the, this, the detectability seemed to be about the same for all durations until you oh, got yeah. up the long numbers. And that's why yeah, I, uh, I moved. Yes, yes. I mean, I think at two seconds already, they're engaging in something different, I would say. And uh, I, I do agree. Uh, the gist signal is small you know, in comparison to how much they have. So if you compare uh, when they have all the time and when they don't, um, the gist signal is smaller, but it is still impressive that they managed to detect these very subtle signs mm -hmm. at uh, a quarter of a second. Thank you. Yeah. So um, let me go on and talk about what we so far think is this global gist signal of abnormality. Um, the first in the first investigation to what it is, uh, we looked at symmetry. Now we did symmetry just because that's, there are two predictors in the medical uh, realm that uh, have been found to be correlated or predict onset of cancer. One of them is symmetry and the second one is breast density. So, and uh, it's symmetry and that's why whenever uh, you, radiologists look at breasts, they always like to look at both of them next to each other like you've seen presented before. So that symmetry is uh, important uh, that, because they believe that the symmetry uh, gives the, the ability to see if there is something abnormal. And uh, here's an idea that I Jeremy had, and I think it worked well since it's hard for people to distinguish between breasts. I think it's easier to see what we mean by symmetry by showing you some butterflies. So if you take an example of this, um, this is an example of a normal mammogram uh, display symmetry where you have the left and right breasts, uh, both from the same woman. And this would be an example of how a mammogram would look if you disrupted that symmetry. And uh, one breast, the second breast would look slightly different. Now, when in mammography we talk about symmetry, it is not really the shape in itself as much as the difference in the textures um, because the shape of the breasts in naturally are very different and also they may appear different because of compression. Uh, different compressions on different breasts. So what we are looking at is just disrupt, very simple disruption of uh, this texture symmetry. And we did this in a very crude way, which was uh, by breaking the symmetry. We used the same uh, flash or we'd call a gist assessment uh, protocol where you fixate, you show the breast for half a second mask, and ask um, the radiologist to rate them on a scale from zero to 100. And the way that we did the breakup was that we would had three conditions. In one condition was a baseline condition where you basically saw breasts uh, from the same woman, both breasts for a same woman, one abnormal, the other one um, compared to cases that are normal. And uh, the first graph that you're seeing 
I am plotting, again, false alarm against hit rate. Uh, the dashed line are individual performances. The full line is the performance, um, average performance. The dashed black line is the performance if you just uh, made this assessment based on breast density. And as you can see that the radiologists clearly show a strong signal in detecting uh, the abnormality at half a second when the symmetry is not broken. When we break the symmetry by showing uh, breasts of um, women from, uh, breasts from two different women, one of them with a lesion, the other one not, compared to two breasts, uh, breasts from two different women, they are both normal, we see that the radiologists can still detect the abnormality, though their performance is reduced. And lastly, the third condition where we did something that um, uh, was at that point, we were interested uh, in seeing what happens if you show the breast that doesn't have the lesion, is contralateral to the lesion side, but still from a woman with cancer. This is the third condition, again, showing two different breasts, but now the breasts, uh, breasts that comes from the cancer case actually doesn't have the lesion. Um, and in here too, we see that the radiologist can detect that there is something wrong, uh, that there is cancer, even though in reality, none of the breasts have a lesion present in them. The performance is reduced, but it's still above chance. Uh, again, we replicate the fact that they can't localize at all where the rate the lesions are, so they're a chance. Uh, the thing that I wanted to say, and I mentioned before, is that, uh, as if you can see uh, that, I mentioned that if you took in breast density as a predictor, you did not find uh, a D prime above chance. And let me just explain what breast density is. It's, as I said, another predictor uh, often used in mammography for cancer. And uh, they usually um, uh, evaluate it by eye. And there are four levels. This would be a very fatty breast, which would mean low breast density, to a very uh, extreme dense uh, breast. And usually when reporting, radiologists will report the density, which then would be a, a predictor of cancer. But as I've shown before, uh, as you can see, the breast density, our GIST uh, signal is not correlated with and not explained by breast density or fully by symmetry in this case. So the next aspect we wanted to investigate was spatial frequency. And this is, as a vision scientist, that's the first stop where you go to. And uh, we were kind of led by thing, uh, research from scene processing, which initially at that time was um, believed to I think that most of the gist is actually seen in low spatial frequencies, though there's nice studies showing that that uh, might not be the case. And definitely our data would support that. We wanted to see if the gist is carried in any, you know, is it in high or low spatial frequencies? So we ran our gist assessment paradigm with another group of radiologists, but we, sorry, uh, but we, um, presented our set of 12, 200 uh, mammograms uh, in three different blocks. In one block, we presented them with just unfiltered images. In the other block, we used the same images, but we uh, passed, uh, did a low pass filter uh, at a cutoff point, taking off all the high spatial frequencies. Or the third block where we took out all the low spatial frequencies and less, just left the high spatial frequencies. And at that time, to our great surprise, we saw that um, actually the gist seems to be strongly carried by high spatial frequencies. When you compare uh, high spatial frequency uh, filtered images to 
unfiltered images, this signal is not significantly different at all. So their D prime is, there's no difference between unfiltered and high pass filtered images. Whereas if we just look at low pass filter, they are actually very, performing very poorly. Uh, later on, our radiologist colleagues told us that that makes sense to them that the, basically that the, all the information is in this fine detail. Uh, again, we're replicating here uh, their inability to actually localize, which means signals that this is not a signal that is coming from a single location, but actually is a global signal. Um, and last but not least is this uh, experiment where we said, well, if you can't localize these lesions, then it, mo it is a global signal. And the final test, is it a global signal, is by taking different sections of the breasts and uh, seeing if they can see the signal just in a section of a breast without seeing the whole breast. And here we did three conditions. In one, we took patches um, of breasts that actually contained the lesion, which would give you the best performance because the lesion was a small area where the lesion was smack in the middle. Then we took patches of breasts that were from the breast that had the lesion, so the ipsilateral breast, but there was no lesion in the patch itself. And lastly, we took a patch uh, from the breast that's contralateral to the breast with a lesion. So this breast does not contain any lesion, but it's from a woman that has cancer, so in the contralateral breast. Uh, we applied our just assessment paradigm where we presented fixation, showed the 256 by 256 pixel patch for 500 milliseconds, masked it, and asked participants participants to rate it on a 0 to 100 scale. And the results are the following. Again, I'm plotting the ROC curves. As you can see, the best performance is for the site with a lesion, which doesn't make, uh, is a good sign. <laughs> uh, but what is more interesting is that we see that radiologists can detect that there is something amiss even in Ipsit patches that are in the ipsilateral breast, but not from the site with the lesion, and even in the contralateral breast, all at above chance performance. So if this is such a global signal and what we think is a characteristic of the texture, we wanted to see if we can characterize the global GIST signal as a texture texture description. And to do this, we employed um, a tex uh, texture synthesizer. So we took our uh, real patches of real breast tissue and then uh, used the Portilla Simoncelli algorithm to train on real breasts and synthesize breast tissue. And we synthesized breast tissue with a lesion and without a lesion and then had 23 radiologists perform, again, a just assessment uh, paradigm where we showed them in one block uh, real patches for 500 milliseconds masked and then asked to um, um, rate, and in another block synthesized patches. And what we find is that when the lesions are absent, um, the real breasts, as well as the synthesized, real patches and synthesized patches, their performance of the radiologists was comparable. There was the same, uh, and in both cases above chance. And when we presented the patches that were, did not have a lesion, but were from the contralateral breast, that is a breast with cancer, but no lesion, uh, they performed much better on, um, sorry, that was the other way around. When the lesion was present, they performed much better on the synthesized than, on the real than the synthesized, but when the lesion wasn't present, they were uh, equal performance. Uh, just to go back and say, when I'm talking about synthesizing, um, the idea of the Portilla-Simoncelli algorithm is that, um, 
you take extract the statistic of the patch and you scramble so there is no uh, local information, everything is scrambled, but the statistic uh, is the same between the synthesized and real breast. So a radiology, what we found from here is that radiologists, uh, when there is no visible lesion, uh, they rely on the texture descriptors and their performance on the synthesized is comparable to real sections. But when there is a visible lesion, there seems to be an additional me mechanism that's employed uh, and the performance increases. However, uh, the synthesized images were successful in completely replicating the breast density of a real mammogram, at least the patches. So another question one might ask in forming, uh, investigating the global GIST signal is, is it related to uh, learned holistic processing that's often described in radiology um, in medical image perception they uh, this very rapid assessment is nothing new to them however they believe that this processing is um, a holistic uh, has a holistic aspect to us that the radiologists take the whole image and that gives them a good sense of where they should look uh, next and we wanted to investigate that in more to see is it really related to holistic processing or at least in holistic processing of how a vision science sees it and we employed uh, the technique of uh, the inversion looking at the inversion effect so we had um, a group of radiologists view uh, mammograms and faces first upright then uh, inverted and we looked uh, at the inversion effect to see if it was existent uh, faces were just making sure that they know they're doing this so we did this in our uh, more of a rapid just presentation mode uh, though you will notice that in this case, initially we did it with longer exposures of radiographs where there was a fixation, the radiograph was presented um, and there was uh, a mask and then you were s supposed to say present abnormal or abnormal. Uh, here we did with faces also where you were supposed to um, identify the emotion saying a natural, uh, neutral or happy. And here, are, here I'm just going to be plotting sensitivity as a bar graph rather than an ROC. And uh, we had a big group of um, experts and residents uh, because this was run at a radiology meeting. And we see that uh, for faces, we get a nice inversion effect, which is better performance for upright than inverted faces, both for experts and residents. That's kind of a sanity check, and that worked. Uh, however, for mammograms, we see that um, while we do not get an inversion effect for residents, we do get it for experts. So there is um, an inversion effect. This ability to discriminate normal from abnormal mammograms would signal that it might be a form of learned or holistic processing. What is more, we see that the mag magnitude of the inversion effect is correlated with number uh, years of experience. But as I pointed out, uh, these mammograms were shown for one whole second, which is for just processing a heck of a long time. So we went and did uh, a version with radiologists again, uh, now reducing the time of presentation. And if you observe when the presentation is very brief, what we are used to of 250 milliseconds, we see absolutely no inversion effect in experts or radiologists, whereas we see it at 1000 milliseconds. So our feeling is that while holistic processing probably is part of evaluating um, mammograms in, with experts, we do not think that um, it is really the thing that allows uh, pro perception of just of the abnormal. So 
what is this global signal of abnormality? Well, it resides in part in symmetry between breasts, but symmetry is not required. It's not a simple assessment of breast density. We've shown that over and over again. Uh, it resides more strongly in high spatial frequencies. Um, it's a very well distributed signal being presented well away from any actual visible disease. Um, it is texture descriptors can explain some of the global signal of abnormality and holistic processing might play a role, but not in that initial blink of an eye. At least we don't think holistic processing is the same thing as just processing. So lastly, this is all great, but why is this just signal important? You know, why you would never expect a radiologist to make an assessment uh, of whether you have cancer in only a quarter of a second. And as you've pointed out, the longer you have, the better your performance is. Well, what is fascinating about this signal is the following. And that is that radiologists, as I've pointed out, uh, can detect this signal well away from the where the lesion is. And uh, this is an experiment we did to kind of prove that point. And that was we looked at uh, radiologists being able to distinguish uh, normal from normal just from a single breast. So in one condition, we presented just a single breast from a normal case and a single breast from the abnormal case uh, containing visible cancer. But then we also did, and you use the flash paradigm, and this is the performance, which is, again, replicating what we find. However, we did another condition where we took the breast from a normal case, and then we took a breast from an abnormal case, but it was contralateral to the lesion. So this contralateral breast did not have any lesion at all visible, but it was from a cancerous case. And as you can see, the radiologist still can still perform this. So they are significantly above chance. The signal is smaller, but it's still there. And, took us to another uh, further degree to say, if you can see it in a contralateral breast, is it possible that this signal for radiologists is detectable years prior to onset of any cancer? This was a study we did in collaboration with a group in Sydney. And the radiologist, again, saw 200 mammograms, uh, which was intermixed with different categories. Some of them were with cancer. Some of them were mammograms that were collected years before onset, two years before onset of cancer, but were what's called retrospectively visible. That is, once you knew there was cancer, you could see it in the priors. Um, and a set that was retrospectively invisible, meaning that even if you knew that the, this person would develop cancer in two years, there was nothing you can see in that image that you could say, you thought was cancer and uh, compared to then contralaterals and normals here again plotting false positives against true positive rate and what is important is that in all of these conditions we see a performance above chance we've replicated this finding of um, con finding a signal in priors in this case this was the study done uh, with three different groups of experts uh, replicated three times. So we had, did, uh, did this test on 21 US radiologists, nine UK radiologists, and 11 reader radiographers in the United Kingdom. Now, uh, unlike uh, the United States, all of Europe and Australia actually uses double reading, which is uh, some something that um, is uh, coming, uh, has great potential maybe to the U.S. also. That is, uh, each case is read by two different radiologists. And because this is very costly in the U.K. and in Australia, they train uh, certain radiographers sign up for training to be reader or screener radiographers. That is, they screen uh, radiology cases. And 
based on our data and from before, they are at the same level of perceptual expertise as any radiologist. And you can see here that even if you show them cases three years prior to concept, onset of cancer, so there's no visib ac visibly actionable cancer, they can still detect reliably the signal. Um, it is small, but it's reliably there. So uh, also just to note that we also looked at their ratings of density at very fast presentation and found no correlation with flash density assessment and the GIST signal. So it isn't, uh, again, not correlated with density. Um, so we also ex wanted to know what is it that allows radiologists to have this expertise. And we looked to different uh, characteristics. And the, one that, the only one that shows promising, um, uh, promising data is actually the number of cases read base it, uh, per year. Now, it is not whether they read only mammographic cases, which is often the case in radiology, that radiologists will read more, more than one modality of radiographs. Uh, it is also not their years of expertise. Actually, what is uh, interesting, the, lo the more expert they are, uh, it seems that they are worse at this signal because that is negatively correlated with how many cases they see. So the strongest and significant correlation we see with their ability to det detect the gist of the abnormal, and especially in the priors, is to the number of cases they read each year. So uh, the more junior you are, the more cases you're going to be reading each year, the more senior, the less cases. And it seems that this, is, this um, ability is very strongly related to perceptual expertise. And um, seeing reading cases is what allows you to hone or tune that expertise to this signal. Um, another little tidbit this is still data which is preliminary and i just wanted to share it with you because it's linked to the studies we are conducting now and that is looking at again at spatial frequencies and this time we've um, tried to uh, hone in on what spatial frequencies might work the best and so far we see that uh, if we take out any spatial frequencies that are below 0.5 uh, cycles per degree that we get um, a huge boost in the signal. And this is a signal for priors. So it goes from uh, a D prime of 0.2 to a D prime of 0.88, which means that, um, which means that if we filter images and leave high spatial frequencies, we might be able to boost the signal even more, even for priors, that is, um, precancerous uh, cases. So um, the global gist signal of abnormal can be detected in the contralateral breast. It can be con detected two years prior to onset of cancer and even three years prior to onset of cancer. Now, that is a big reason of why this is so exciting and important because this means you have a possibility to use something like this as um, a, what we will call a perceptual marker or a risk factor for cancer. And while it is small, there are different ways that you can use this. Obviously, for, for us, uh, a 0.2D prime is not uh, a lot, but combined with many other things, it can move cancer, you know, miss errors from 30% down to 15 or 10%. Um, in conjunction with different techniques, you can use it for triage to decide which images you should see first or look at longer. You can use it to combine this signal with computer-aided detection. In this case, nowadays, uh, uh, deep learning algorithms. And there are some nice studies, including some of the preliminary data Jeremy and I have been playing with, is that if you combine this uh, GIST signal from radiologists with uh, a deep learning network, you actually get better performance than either alone. And then again, if this can be isolated, there is a nice way to use 
uh, this for training radiologists uh, further. And that's about it. I just wanted to say there's been uh, a lot of people that worked on this with me, primarily Jeremy, who's, if you have any other questions, he can answer them too. <laughs> uh, this work was also done with Jim Tanaka, Patrick Brennan, Michael Melchi, Mary Culpan, and Tamara Haygood, Haygood and Yelda Seitzmer, and now uh, working with uh, my graduate student, Emma Ratt, and a lot of you experiments, and that's it. Thank you. So, Get some questions? Sure. Uh, would you want me to stop sharing the screen? Uh, or shall I leave it? Let's leave it there in case people have specific questions about any, <clears throat> okay. any slides. Hi, Carla. I have a question. Hi. Sure. It's really wonderful work, and um, I think it actually really makes sense for uh, to help the radiologists if this it's uh, like useful information that you, they can use. And talking about like, because you mentioned that in UK they have like two people actually going through the um, mammographs, if yes. I understand correctly. So I was wondering, have you ever looked at the between radiologists um, like similarity or are they agree with each other on the uh, on the on their classification of the mammographs? Because uh, they are all tested using the same like set of uh, images in each experiment. So I'm just wondering like whether you have to take a look at those individual differences. Uh, that's a very good question. Actually, they do follow um, in regular practice, clinical practice, they do follow this very carefully, uh, the agreement between the radiologists on that. And I don't know on the top of my head, what is the percentage of times that they agree? Usually, mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know what the reports are. We have not looked at um, kind of looking at double reading mm -hmm. uh, between our people because, you know, it would mean having yeah. to look how they agree. One thing that we did look at, and that was to see if maybe this just signal might be due to be carried by certain cases. So we did mm -hmm. an item analysis. I see. And it's not um, the same cases definitely so um, yeah. that I can say that but did we look at usually there we did for this priors we did some assessment of inter-rater agreement and it's used and it is def significant so it's well above chance but yeah. uh, pure double reading where we would compare block mm -hmm. by block we didn't so. Yeah, because um, I think it's, I'm just curious about like whether they actually have the same kind of just information or through years of training, maybe they develop different strategies for finding different gist that might be useful for themselves. So I'm kind of curious, like maybe some of the items might be specifically um, have some specific gist that is uh, more sensitive to some radiologists and some others are not as sensitive as others. So that's why I asked this question. So th there are there are individual differences. You know, we've had, um, I guess, just even looking at now, probably we have data from probably 150 different radiologists. There are individual differences. Some people that are better than others. Mm -hmm. um, as I've mentioned before, uh, we found that people that tend to see about more than 6,000 uh, images a year are extremely good at this. You know, we're looking at D primes of 2.3 for these people, whereas there's people that are not as good. So uh, they are, we haven't, you know, um, is it that, are they seeing something different in each case? Um, I don't know. I, uh, I don't know if there is a strategy that we can, can look at. I mean, most definitely one thing that I can say that if they try to, you know, look at the image and try to move their eyes to get it, they definitely will fail at it. I think the only strategy that's good is to sit and let you, you know, kind of, as you say, open up your window of attention, kind of, and take it in, and um, you do fine. Uh, but uh, I think at a half a second, there is not a strategy. And I'm not sure, I mean, that we have a way to test 
sensed if they're seeing different features of the signal at this point, but yeah. there are definitely individual differences mm -hmm. in the ability to do that. Cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I've got some questions. Uh, Carl, it's a beautiful yeah. studies. Uh, um, I've got a couple of questions, maybe too many. Um, just a quick one. Um, high spatial frequencies, that's sort of an abnormal way to look at the mammograms, and I'm surprised that they did so well because they're, they don't, do they usually do that, or is that something novel for them? Um, that is definitely something novel for them. They do play around with contrast. You know, they, they uh, do like that. Well, they bring a but they don't play around with frequency at that point. They didn't mind it. And actually it was um, very interesting to see that they actually do so well. And after talking to them afterwards, uh, they didn't find it, um, didn't find it unusual actually. They found it interesting that they, act, they felt that they did better with just seeing the high spatial frequencies. One thing that is very important, I want to point this out um, because this is, it took a long time to get this just right. Because when you do this type of uh, filtering, what often happens is that if you filter out um, the low spatial frequencies and just leave the high spatial frequencies, you uh, make the image much darker. So when you're doing this, what you need to do is make sure that you equalize the contrasts. And that is something there was a talk, um, night, it was interesting because there was a talk at VSS this year. I think Dirk Walther was presenting that, what he also shows that if uh, many of the previous studies that have said that it's low spatial frequencies that carry the global characteristics uh, were wrong, in the sense that they were never contrast equalized. And if you contrast equalize, uh, then you actually don't see uh, the advantage of low spatial frequency uh, filtering. But um, so we did a lot of, took a lot of care to contrast equalize and it wasn't unusual for radiologists to see the high spatial frequencies. But in practice, they, they don't do it, you're right. Um, just, um the, you have a tremendous amount of cooperation from these radios, so many, which I'm very surprised. And I take it these are in Europe, and I'm, I'm not sure, I'm just curious whether in America you would be able to do this, because I, I, I haven't done much clinical work in the past. I found yeah. a little bit more, I sort of get the impression it's more difficult in America, and I just want to comment on that, because... It yeah, like it, it is, it, it's interesting, because there's a whole other discussion on it. Uh, one... Um, I guess um, I've, I was lucky because um, I have a very good rapport with radiologists, even in the US. But what helps in the United States, and that's something that uh, we have a big thank you to give to Jeremy and Todd Horowitz also, that they've organized this uh, perceptual lab that's run at RSNA um, that uh, allows researchers to come in, I mean, like us, uh, and run studies. Um, at that, during that conference. And this was, um, they came up, I think, with this idea from uh, actually our initial study that we did, that first uh, uh, study that we did where we basically crashed, uh, I think it was a just a breast imaging conference. And that was because we had a breast imager uh, co-author there and, and she did um, a lot of lobbying for us so it helped that she called in her friends and they did it. What works well uh, with this study is that it's very short so it takes only half an hour to do these very just uh, assessment experiments so you can have a uh, radiologist do you know an assessment or even of 400 images or mammograms in half an hour which makes it easier so it isn't hard are there at a conference, they go ahead and do it. And uh, so that has been very useful to be able to run these at these different conferences. But also just to speak on to the difference between radiologists in the UK and the US, it is very different. The fact that UK has um, uh, a national health <laughs> uh, system, which means that radio. Uh, doctors uh, have a very different view of um, science and sharing and they're not 
so monetarily uh, oriented, you will find very often that people in the United Kingdom are happy to participate and do not require uh, to be authors or to be uh, monetarily recompensated on it. They are very happy to do it, very excited about the research. Um, and it's also different because uh, in the U.S., most radio a lot of radiologists are also uh, doing their um, are researchers, and as such, they get um, time. I think one a day a week is in teaching hospitals where they can dedicate to research. So, again, they're looking at advancing their careers. Where in the United Kingdom, that is not how you advance your career. Research is something that you want to do, that you do because it, it is something that you should be doing and it should advance uh, the national health. So I've, it is much easier for me to find collaborators in United, or people to do uh, studies in the UK than they are in the US. And I think it's just the system is different. It isn't oriented so much to monetary reward as it is in the US. It's also worth mentioning that Carla actually turns out to be a radiologist whisperer. <laughs> um, yeah. What does that mean? It means that, well, you know, let, let, like, like the people who can um, persuade a, a, a wild horse to okay, calm okay, down okay. instantly, uh, 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 Carla, we'll give, Carla can make radiology. We'll give, things. We'll give all the credit to the, the British National Health Service. Yeah. Um, um, just a little bit of sort of crystal balling about the type of research that you're doing, which is really, uh, really first class. And do you, what do you see happening in the field of radiology, combining this with machine learning? And what are the different possible outcomes that could happen if people start working here and cooperating? And what, what are sort of different outcomes that one can envision in this field of the field of radiology? I, I think there is that this is definitely, especially with machine learning, this is the time to strike because I think they've definitely seen uh, the advantages uh, of this because a classical computer aided detection um, has really, it's been around for probably more than 10 years or even longer in radiology. That is uh, all the radiographs in addition to seeing them, assessing them. Uh, I think every practice has uh, some type of algorithm that pre-processes these images and then gives them um, what they call these CAD assessments where you can, uh, they can turn it on and the computer-aided detection system will mark the uh, places where they want to see. And they've had it for years. The problem is that they are, these are imperfect and um, a lot of radiologists don't like to use them and sometimes completely bypass them. Uh, for different reasons, one of them being that it's time consuming, uh, the fact that it also marks everything and it bothers them to the fact that they find it distracting. So there's definitely a need for something new. Uh, and I think they see the need that um, to improve the screening because uh, it hasn't really budged for a long time, this 25 to 30% miss rate has not budged. <laughs> and um, if, they're, if they're going to uh, continue to, how shall I say, ask for big funds to support screening, they, they need to make that better, obviously. And they're motivated to make it better. But with the new AI systems, this deep learning that have allowed um, you know, this idea that um, you might actually not need a radiologist to do that, that's brought about some excitement, though, as Jeremy will attest to this, we're, even though some people think, oh, it's the machines will do everything, we are far away from entrusting uh, our health to the machines, and there are many, many issues with that. Uh, and one good way to kind of resolve a lot of the issues of AI is by combining human assessments, so expert assessments with AI. And this work, understanding how the humans do it and what is the signal that they use and the strategies they employ 
to at least validate or make these systems better, I think is definitely the future. And this is a time to strike. Obviously, I think always in combination with AI because they just, you know, the amount of images that they can do. There's a very exciting um, new study uh, that came out in Nature in January. It's um, a study that's collaboration between UK and the US where they have uh, employed an AI system to look at, um, you know, at how well it does on assessing uh, whether there's uh, cancers. What's very exciting about that is that they trained the system on a UK database and then tested in a US database, which is a big, I think one of the first studies that have done that because that's one of the big drawbacks of uh, AI systems is that uh, they have a hard time generalizing, whereas a radiologist doesn't matter. You can show him an image from any, uh, a radiograph acquired at, from any machine, whether di in a digital or an analog form, and they'll be fine with it, right? Whereas AI systems have this problem. But even that is bridging. However, um, the, as you know, Jeremy can also tell you, uh, it's this hybrid model of combining um, expert, uh, you know, diagnosis with AI that I think is the future. And Jeremy has, uh, has presented this something on this last year. I don't know if you've done it this year in VSS, uh, using this kind of hybrid combination of perceptual signals and AI signals to advance that. Thank so you. yeah, I think that's the future. Thanks a lot. Can I ask a question about the the, sure. the the experience of the experts? You said that the more experience, the more experienced ones get better at this. Yeah. And I wonder, is your group or others working to try to build a training program so that you could directly teach people to do this? There's a group at Penn that are doing this with with experts on making diagnostics about the future. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, thank you very much for that <laughs> You're kind of, yes, that is a, that we are in the middle of doing that. So my graduate student, Emma Ratt, is building up this database. We've been uh, working hard at figuring out exactly how to do the training. So the idea is to see if we can train complete na novices, naives on this signal and see how long it takes. And um, then we were gonna pass on to radiologists, radiologists themselves. Um, it's a training, pro we believe that this GIST signal is um, a signal as global. Uh, so one premise is that I think it's learned via statistical learning. So, because if you ask a radiologist what made them decide that there was an abnormality, they have a very hard time telling you what it is. So, it's something that's implicit. And thus, this would lead you to think that this signal is acquired through statistical learning with the visual system being tuned to whatever it is. So, we're designing this training study where we will be training them trying out the statistical learning where you get feedback, but not feedback on location of the lesion, but rather were you right? Was there an abnormality or not? Uh, we're also uh, doing adaptive training, both in um, uh, not only making it, uh, mixing, making it harder, trying to go from cases where there's an, um, you know, an abnormality that is obvious abnormality to subtle abnormalities all the way to have them assess uh, image priors. So images acquired, uh, pre-cancerous cases acquired three years before onset of cancer. We are also um, adaptive training with uh, exposure durations. We're gonna start with having them see it um, for as long as they want and then slowly bring them back bring them down to assessments of 500 milliseconds. It's a big study. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things to work out and we're hoping to do this. The training is supposed to go across 12 weeks uh, and we're gonna have a training session three weeks, three days a week. And we're planning to do this online. So it's a big study <laughs> in the works. So yes. Uh, we're going to try first on novices to show that 
we think what we think it is that it's a statistical learning of a global signal and then we're going to try and see if we can uh, do this first to with radiographers that are training to be reader radiographers and then on radiologists yeah Charlotte can I ask a question sure uh, yeah that was a wonderful talk really well presented very very clear I had a follow-up question or another question about the spatial frequency mm -hmm. filtering so yeah. the it's clear that high spatial frequencies are better performance, but people were still well above chance at the low spatial frequencies. And so the part of the, yeah. one of the questions I have about that is whether there's independent information carried by different spatial frequency bands. Um, you could take Cindy's approach and look at the individual differences to figure that out. That would be an easy way with the existing data to know whether there's uh, independent information. And part of the reason that could be useful is one, you could tailor images for individual um, radiologists, but mm -hmm. even more importantly, you could get double reading out of U.S. data by presenting the same image to the same observer. So not you yeah. don't even need to use different observers. You can just present the same image filtered in different bands to the same observer and get effective double reader or triple reader from within mm -hmm. one person. Yeah, I mean, we already kind of have that data because this high and low spatial frequency uh, aspect is, I mean, all of each reader saw all three, uh, all three versions of the same image. So uh, we can easily look at that. But that's a good point. What we are looking, uh, we're, the way we we're going to go about this is that we were, so this is very crude, uh, you know, this is very crude, how shall I say, filtering where you just basically bandpass filtered stuff right uh, we've looked uh, we're trying to pinpoint where which exact which of the high spatial frequencies show better performance so this study that we have now running might actually work and that design as you suggested because we're going to have the same uh, reader see uh, four different bands of spatial frequency cutoffs and uh, see if there are in the, you know, differences there. But another way that we are also try, we want to approach this is also go into notch filtering, where we're gonna go and try and take the images and notch filter out certain frequencies um, to see if you, know, if you take out the frequency, is the signal gone? That's another aspect. So this, yeah, a lot of, uh, yeah. This is only nine subjects, but do you have a sense whether the whether there's a individual differences here? In other words, are the subjects who are good at high pass also the ones who are good at low pass? Uh, that I don't know. I have to look at that. This is just the first data. Uh, we have another study, and it's the one that I presented about with priors. Uh, there we have 23 subjects on that, and I could look at that. I didn't look if they were good at high, were they good at low? Um, I would have to look at that. Uh, I don't know if 21 is enough, uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's something I would take a look at. And this frequency study that we're running now, also online, hopefully will uh, you know, garner us more participants and more looking at individual differences on that. Cool, so, thanks. Yeah, welcome. I have a couple questions. Um, sure. Carla, er, early in your talk, I think one of the first uh, breast slides that you showed, mm -hmm. um, you put up a little red circle and you made a comment like, well, after all these years, I should be able to find it, but I still like to have yeah. the red circle. And yeah. it, it made me wonder if after all these years, um, are you almost as good as a radiologist? And then at the end of your talk, when you showed that slide showing yeah. that people are better if they look at 6,000 images yeah. a year. I thought, well, maybe not. Maybe you don't look at yeah. that many different images every no. day. I, I think, yeah. So I think that's the point. That's the thing that most people think, well, it's, you know, it's an expertise that you get and you keep it, right? Like medical knowledge. But I don't, you know, all the data that we've seen so far would point to the fact of either you use it or you lose it. It's kind of that kind of tuning. You probably would, uh, you know, easily come back to that high performance once you started seeing it a lot. Uh, but um, it's uh, something that you train your system to, to see, I think. 
And also to speaking to that is also the data from UK uh, radiographers, you know, reader radiographers. These are people that have, uh, you know, maybe one more year of, they don't have a medical degree. They have maybe one year, one more year of schooling when they are trained to screen radiographs. And there's, you know, training is composed of having to successfully screen 5,000 mammograms in a year, right? Um, and that's basically what their training is. But their performance is as good as any radiologists, either UK or US. Um, and that's kind of one other thing that is a bit scary is that for uh, US residents to pass their residency, they are required to screen only 500 radiographs in a year, which is really a small number. <laughs> So, especially if you're looking at perceptual expertise for radiologists, yeah. I have a question. Um, I'm wondering yeah. if so you show that um, even a year or two years before the cancer showed up, they're, yeah. they're getting the gist, they're predicting. Yeah. And also they're from the non-cancerous uh, breast, they're, mm -hmm. they're, so is this, um, what about, is there some factor like, and um, the only thing I know is like the BRCA1 gene or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like, so are there some, are, I, I just wonder about some people that, that they might be picking up something that is, oops, wrong way, uh, constitutional in the, in the person that, that's a, that gives them a propensity to have cancer. That's, as yeah. actually, as actually finding, uh, actually seeing the cancer in the gist because they can't mm -hmm. localize it, but maybe, maybe it's so, something. Yeah, well, th this is what we think. So if you look back and dig into uh, the literature, um, cytology literature of breast cancer and other things, you you will find often uh, that uh, there is reports um, that they find cancerous cells or in the breast that's contralateral to the cell with cancer. They see changes on the cellular level much earlier than they do basically on, um, on at the level of you know, imaging level like the radiology. And what we think is happening, why the radiologists are able to detect that signal in the contralateral and three years prior to onset of any cancer is that I think that these changes affect the parenchyma and that affect uh, parenchyma is the texture of, uh, of the tissue. Um, they change that texture in a way that is enough of a signal for somebody, for a visual system that is very well tuned to what a texture, a normal texture should look like, is a warning sign. And that's why they're able to see it. They're, they're, I think they're, it's just knowing, um, you know, there's a change in the texture and the radiologists pick it up. Now there's no, there's nothing vis visibly actionable where they can pinpoint, this is it. But the whole texture, the whole parenchyma changes and that's visible to them. And there is good, you know, evidence in, as I said, in cytology of breasts that show that these are evident there before any lesion forms. And what is cool about this is that actually our human visual system, when you're not asked to scrutinize and identify and localize, but go by these global statistics and textures, you're able to detect that, um, that disruption. Uh, of the pattern. So I think that's what it is. And that's why it's so exciting that if the visual system is detecting it, it's not something magic. It's there. It's happening. We just happen to be very well tuned to it, to see it. It's like the same thing. We can't help but not notice pattern. And that's why I also think that the training with statistical learning has, uh, has potential and might be the way to go ahead with this. 
if I could just follow up on that uh, thing, yeah. you had uh, some results of the people given synthetic images that you produced with the Portia Simoncelli method. Yeah. And um, I, it, it clearly then the, the, the synthesis algorithm is capturing something that's important. Yeah. And it seems to me that the, the positive and negative images, uh, you know, might sort of cluster in that texture space and you could use mm -hmm. the encoding to make a discriminator. Have you or has anyone done that or? Um... No, n not yet. That's on a to-do list. <laughs> that is, that's why we started with the Portilla Simoncelli, just as a, again, a, a, as a good candidate of it. The problem is this algorithm is, looks at over thousand statistics, image statistics. So to really, um, you know, you have to dig into this to really find uh, which one of these statistics carries it and defines it. It's, it's, it's a lot of work, uh, but it is, you know, question is where do you start and how do you do it? Again, uh, what would work well um, is that if you would were able to run these studies on people that are trained on this signal without having to ask radiologists to do it. This comes back to Ken's question of how the heck do you do these on radiologists? Their time, even though I managed to get, you know, rope them in to do this, there's a limit to how many studies and how many trials they can see. So um, what would ideally be thing that if we can train this on naives and they can detect this signal or radio, you know, reader radiographers, then we could go and, um, you know, nicely examine uh, these textures. But I think it is in the texture. I definitely think uh, it is the signal is in the texture. What aspect of the texture? That's, that's the big question. So I don't know if I've answered your question. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you, you have presumably somewhere all those coefficients laying around, you could analyze them and see sort of which uh, which dimensions are the discriminative ones. And then I, you know, earlier mm -hmm. also there was discussion about the spatial frequency filtering. Yeah. I mean, given that these texture descriptors are sort of like, you know, second order combinations yeah. of different filters, you might be able to kind of amplify the texture differences. So not just yeah. band filtering, but, you know, these second order filtering and yeah, that, that, that's that's a great suggestion. Definitely, I mean, I I I think it's great. We've got a whole set of images. I'll, I'll it's worthwhile digging into that code. I want, just also want to mention we've been trying uh, on that aspect, also trying a new approach. Looking back, since we have the ground truth from radiologists, we've been looking at taking these images and actually just doing the analysis and seeing. Uh, which of these images, what are the characteristics of them? Our first approach was at this moment, we're working with different uh, symmetry metrics, uh, looking at global and local symmetry and trying to see if um, these images that were detected as having abnormalities have certain global or local symmetries that allow for this higher performance. And I guess the next one to tackle would be, as you've suggested, uh, these different texture uh, characteristics from Portella and Simicelli. A lot of work to be done, but these are all great suggestions. Thank you. Can I make a, just a, a comment on that, on the spatial sure. frequencies? Dave Green did work on profile analysis in okay. which he showed hypersensitivity in people to differences in frequencies, not just to detecting a given frequency, but okay. in comparing information and in comparing activity in one frequency to its neighbors and looking at the spectral profile, and, and I, I guess you probably know about that word, but um, it might be quite related to what they're pulling out when they look at, at, at the texture. Yeah, it, it is very possible that profile. because, yeah. yeah, the profile, yeah. It is, it's very right. It is possible that it is what allows them to do that. It's the sensitivity to certain spatial frequencies that other people, the differences, yeah. Um. Okay, well, uh, yeah. any other questions? Otherwise, can we all 
Uh, thank Carla for the wonderful talk. Yeah. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Albert. You've uh, already given me full payment in all the fantastic questions. That's the best part of it. <laughs> So thank you very much for your attention and thank you for these great questions. And if you do have some more or suggestions, uh, my email is easy to find. If not, ask Dave, David, and uh, thank you very much again for this opportunity. Oh, thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much.